Binabati ko kayo mga kapatid sa pangalan ng ating Panginoong Heso Kristo. Tayo ngayon ay magpapatuloy sa ating Sunday School sa pag-aaral ng Paksang Christian Holiness at ating, ating pinag-aaralan ngayon ang Sexual Issues and Sins. Tayo ngayon ay nasa ikalim, ikalimang yugto ng ating pag-aaral nito. At sa harap ng napakaluwag na henerasyon ng ating lipunan, napakahalaga sa mga kristyano na sila ay manindigan at para sila makapanindigan, kailangan alam nila ang mga prinsipyo ng salita ng Diyos. Dalawang prinsipyo ang ating pinag-aralan sa paksang ito. Unang-una ay ang male-female distinction at sinabi natin na sa paglalalang ng Diyos, ang pagkakaiba ng babae at lalaki ay nasa katawan, wala sa isip o damdamin, yan ay nasa katawan kung kaya ang una nating kasalanan na hinarap ay homosexuality and however acceptable this lifestyle is in our present society, homosexuality as far as Christians are concerned is, is still a defiance of God's created distinction. Ang pinakabuod na talatang ginamit natin from 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 shows that homosexuality remains under the condemnation of God. It will not, those who are guilty of this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet the same passage uh, offers the hope of transformation because the Corinthian people, some of whom were guilty of that lifestyle in the past, were changed by God because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Yan ang mensahe natin sa mga homosexuals. Ang ikalawang prinsipyo na pinag-aralan natin ay marriage sexual union. Sa paglalalang pa lang ng Diyos, in His creation mandate, pinagsama niya ang pag-aasawa at ang sexual na relasyon at ito ay sinusugan ng bagong tipan so that the marriage bed is pure. And so we say that for the two in marriage, nothing is defined of the sexual act but th those two also define for us what is sinful sexual act or relationship it should not be more or less than the two at sa mga sexual sins na pinag-aralan natin una nating tiningnan ay solo sex uh, or sex by one's lonesome through self-stimulation in all its forms is are sinful in the sight of God. And then we looked at non-marital sex. This is beyond the two in marriage. And non-marital sex can be by coercion. And that is sinful. And then last week we considered non-marital sex with consent. And under that is fornication. Fornication is sexual relationship between unmarried people in its strict sense. At tiningnan natin dito ang prostitution as well as premarital sex. And the heavier type of non-marital sex with consent is adultery because there is involved a breach of the marital covenant. Kagaya ng aking sinabi, gusto ko na mas maging positibo sa mga susunod na leksyon at ang dapat na unahin natin ay how do we deal with sexual temptations? And one thing that that is crying for a response is where do those temptations come? Saan ba galing ang mga tukso sa sexual na kasalanan? Marami yan. Gusto kong tutukan ay yung may control tayo. Uh, sa iba, wala tayong control. Pero may isang bagay kung saan tayo ay may control at particular kung kakausapin ang ating mga kababaihan. And I want you to bear with me. I'm your pastor who loves you and cares for you. And I do not mean any offense, but this must be addressed because this is biblical. So in resisting sexual temptation, I want to focus now on the female apparel. And again, I appeal for humble attitude to the teaching of the Word of God. But let me begin with a clarification and that is that women are predominantly the victim of male sexual sin this is corroborated by any statistics in any country i suppose uh, sa lahat ng lipunan ang mga kababaihan ang madalas na biktima ng kasalanan ng mga kalalakihan sa sexual na paraan so we do not deny that that is a fact in all societies therefore it follows that women should not be blamed for male sexual 
offenses. Tanggalin natin sa isip natin ang paninisi sa kanila. And there are still people who think the, we, the woman was asking for it. Eh, we disabuse our minds of such uh, wrong mentality. And we should maintain that women should be safeguarded. Women are predominantly the victim and they should not be blamed. But now that said, it is naive and for Christians unbiblical to simply ignore what the Bible says concerning the way you dress, your apparel. Female carelessness in apparel may provoke male lust. And that is a fact that I will show from the scriptures. At kung titingnan natin ang uri ng pananamit ngayon, ay it, there is increasing immodesty in the way women, especially young women, dress today. And there is one author who gave these challenging words uh, in her book, Barbara, Barbara Hughes, her book, Disciplines of a Godly Woman. She challenges if you're blind or from, or from another planet, you may have conceivably missed the fact that modesty has disappeared. It is dead and buried. If you don't think so, go shopping with a teenager. And I'm sure this will resonate uh, with some parents out there who have young daughters, teenage daughters, and the kind of apparel that you see worn by many women and young women especially is of the immodest kind and therefore i want to make an appeal to you my dear sisters in the lord and my appeal is as a godly woman be mindful not to incite lust in men now this appeal is not an opinion it is an appeal that is based upon a biblical assumption as well as a biblical command so let us go first to the biblical assumption and that is that sight incites desire. Ay walang masama dyan. Ginagamit ng Panginoon ang paningin natin para pumukaw ng tamang hangarin. Makita mo ang napakagandang nilikha ng Diyos sa kalikasan. Maari ang pumukaw sa iyo ng pagsamba sa Diyos. Kaya magandang bagay ang ating paningin na pumupukaw ng hangarin. But in a fallen world, it often becomes an occasion for sin. Sight can incite the wrong desire and that wrong desire can be lust. So we see this for example in the very first sin of mankind when the serpent used by satan was tempting the woman eve the response we are told in genesis 3 6 was that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes so what began in the eyes result in what lay what became tragic history and then a father advising his young son in the book of Proverbs, tells him, Do not lust in your heart, talking of the adulterous woman. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes. Now, the eyes here belong to the adulteress, but uh, the reason why those eyes captivate is because the man is looking. And by looking, he is captivated and his heart lusts after her beauty. Now the most familiar story of this nature we know in the scriptures is that of David. I will not go through the details. We have discussed this in a previous lecture. But because David looked where he should not have looked and it resulted in sexual sin, the end result of that, according to 2 Samuel 11.27, was that the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Kaya nakatingin ang Panginoon sa mga tinitingnan natin. Yan ang sinasabi niyan. And you are familiar, I have used this in, in other occasions, um, in the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus, Matthew 5.29, If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out or tear it away. Now, 
there is another context of the same language in the same book of Matthew, but this time it takes into consideration the source of temptation, and that is in Matthew 18. It is necessary that temptation should come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And then the familiar language, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. So the offender, the man in this case, he remains under indictment, but the source of temptation is also indicted. So uh, my appeal is based on a biblical assumption, but it is also based on biblical command. That female apparel is a responsibility mandated of Christian women. So we have two passages that are key to this. The first is 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So in the context of the assembly of the church, and we can extend this to anything that is public in nature, women's outfit is a matter of concern for modesty. And then in 1 Peter 3 verses 3 and 4, with regard to wives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So here, the words that we see repeated are modesty, decency, propriety. Now, rather than belaboring the meaning of each word, I just want to say that the common denominator in all these words is the sense of honor. That is, the kind of apparel that makes a woman honorable in the eyes of others. The opposite of this is not good to the ears, but this is the opposite of the Greek word. It is shamelessness. Walang kahihiyan. At maaring mangyari iyan sa ating puri ng kasuotan. And the emphasis on both passages is that it is more than the external that makes one truly wholesome. The inner character is what counts yung ating panloob na katangian. Now I am aware that some of you may be bothered by the reference to braided hair or even jewelries. Masama ba ang braided hair at magsuot ng mga alahas? Well, I think the commentary of the ESV Archaeology Study Bible may help. It says that artistic depictions of upper-class women show a wide variety of hairstyles and hair accessories, including tiaras, jeweled pins, strings of pearls, and ribbons. Braided hair was common and wigs were fashionable, particularly blonde wigs made from the hair of women from beyond the borders of the empire. Paul is not forbidding jewelry per se, but rather excessively expensive jewelry and clothing worn ostentatiously to exalt oneself and perhaps cause envy in other women. So there's the explanation. During this period in their culture, the braided hair was a status symbol, a status statement of being upper class. And to bring that to simple gatherings such as the church assembly and uh, in public is to become ostentatious. Ibig sabihin, pasikat, nagpapalabas. So, it hindi pinagbabawal dito ang braided hair as such o ang mga jewelries. Uh, ang sinasabi ay the attitude that is ostentatious which becomes the explanation for the culture which was associated with upper-class people, eh, hindi ganyan dapat ang alalahanin ng isang bab uh, babaeng makadyos. Kaya uh, panariwain natin ang itinuturo ng Biblia tungkol sa 
layunin ng ating mga kasuotan. This goes for male and female, but I want to stress the female apparel. And there are three reasons or purposes that we can cite for female apparel. The one is, the first is costume, kasuotan. Now, we use costume to mean a culture's way of dressing, but we also use this in terms of the occasion for which something is uh, worn, like sinasabi natin, uh, wedding costume. So, when we say costume, we mean the functional propriety for the occasion or vocation of our apparel. The second is covering. And covering means decent concealment of what is not for showing. Yung hindi dapat ipakita, dapat takpan, dapat itago. Isang uh, dahilan yan ng kasuotan. And then the third is adornment. And so there is a concern for wholesomeness, for beauty, because adornment is, is oriented to appropriate beautifying. Now let us consider this purposes one by one. The first is costume and as I defined it, it is functional propriety for the occasion or vocation. Yung nararapat sa okasyon, nararapat sa iyong panawagan o trabaho, makikita natin ang isang halimbawa nito tungkol kay John the Baptist, Jesus himself saying, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. So in other words, hindi mo mapagkakamalan si John the Baptist na miyembro ng royalty, tagapalasyo, by his very dress. That dress bespoke of his vocation as prophet. At may itinuturo ito sa atin. Uh, choose what is appropriate for the occasion and the vocation. So halimbawa, hindi pinagbabawal na mag-shorts ang babae, decent shorts, may I add, na sa tamang okasyon like sports activities, walking shorts, etc. or that which is according to your vocation. But uh, that is uh, something that uh, bespeaks of the right occasion and your vocation. But it can be used wrongly. And we have again the father warning his son in the book of Proverbs 7 verse 10. The woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Now, why does he know that this woman was a prostitute in the manner of his dress? Why? What is the prostitute after? Pinag-aralan natin ito about prostitution. The purpose of the prostitute is sexual seduction for money. Pero hindi naman niya gagawin yan by direct solicitation. The first thing, she will try to lure the attention and company of would-be victims ay through her manner of dressing. The prostitute does her sexual seduction through immodest dress. Now, here is my warning to you, my dear sisters. Unintentionally, female apparel may have the effect of seduction. Again, I'm not imputing motives. I'm not reading intentions. It is not my purpose. But with all the pastoral concern that I can extend to you, you may not know it, baka sumusunod ka lang sa uso, napanood mo sa TV, nakikita mo sa marami. So unintentionally, but without realizing it, the way you're, you are dressed is seductive. And we need to understand that the function is for propriety, for the occasion and vocation. And then the second purpose is covering. And I defined it as decent concealment of what is not appropriate for showing. Now, it is interesting, the first time that mankind made that attempt was at the fall. At the fall, one of the results was that for the first time, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And 
We have here two verses. The first verse, verse 7, shows the human attempts. And they came up with, and the Hebrew word is translated in some versions as loincloth, in other versions as belt. In other words, it did not really cover. And then in verse 21 was God's way of dressing them up and it covered. So this shows that God himself is concerned that in a state of fallen world, we must be covered because without that covering, it will incite lust. And this is corroborated by the fact that sinful sex in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Law, is described regularly as uncovering someone's nakedness. Leviticus 18, 6 and following show the series of prohibitions of the kind of sexual relationship that is sinful. And regularly, the description used is uncover someone's nakedness, which means that it is sinful to uncover the nakedness other than that of uh, the wife. Now, that extends to clothing. If clothing does not cover nakedness, it is like inviting to sinful sexual relationship. And there is an interesting passage in Ezekiel 16, 36 and 37 that shows Judah's sin of idolatry expressed in terms of uncovered nakedness. Uh, it says, Because your lust was poured out and your nakedness was uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols. So this is their sin. Their idolatry expressed as uncovering their nakedness. Now, Yahweh's response is, I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. Pinapakita nito that uncovering nakedness is both sin and punishment. E sometimes hindi mo na malaman kung nasaan ang linya. Uh, nagkakasala ba siya na halos wala siyang pang ma maayos na pantakip sa kanyang katawan o Pinaparusahan na siya na wala na siyang manhid, na wala na siya ng kahihiyan sa kanyang ginagawa. But there you see, it can be both sin and punishment which again tells us an important principle of application. Any apparel that is revealing or suggestive of nakedness is not consistent with its function of covering. And, and women must be very conscious and mindful of this exposure of body parts or skin that should be better covered is characteristic of our time. You go out there on the streets and it is a jungle of exposed body and skin. And that's because of skimpy attires na halos wala nang itinira o kaya naman Nagpantalon nga, ginupitan pa at binutasan para kung anong makita or maaring puno ng suot but skin tight and it simply shows all the contours of her figure which also suggests nakedness. Now, I'll let you in on a secret. Perhaps not a secret after all. It is about the male mind when influenced by lust. And that is that male lustful eyes can undress a woman in thought. So without you realizing it, you are with a man influenced by lust and he is undressing you. Do not make it easy for him. Do not invite him to do so. So female apparel should not invite males to do so. Uh, uh, that is to undress them mentally and you will make it easy for them if your apparel is suggestive or revealing of nakedness. Then the third purpose is adornment which is oriented to beautifying. Which only reminds us that godliness is not anti-beauty, 
uh, contrary to their thinking of many today. Uh, God, in fact, uses that figure in order to in order to speak of the change that grace makes from the ugliness of sin to the beauty of grace. A eh, ginamit niya ang larawan ng pagsusuot ng maganda. In Isaiah 61.10, in the King James language, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So there, adornment is used positively, to speak of that which is beautiful, just as God makes an ugly sinner into a beautiful saint, and the language of adornment is used. Now, adornment can be both positive and negative, and we see this in the book of Revelation. Adornment as positive is spoken of the bride of Christ at his second coming, that refers, of course, to the church she will be adorned as a bride for her betrothed husband. But adornment, the same word is used in the negative sense, also in Revelation and 17.4, it refers to the Babylonian harlot, which stands for false religion that is seeking to harm the Church of Christ in history. And it is adornment because the effectiveness of false religion is in its attractiveness. So adornment can be both positive and negative. And again, in terms of application, apparel rightly beautifies. But for Christians, for Christian women, be mindful that it is in order to highlight Christian testimony. So your apparel can help or may not help. Your apparel may help or hide your Christian profession. Uh, I cite as an example unfeminine outfit. And there is a principle we can apply from the, from the Mosaic Law. In Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman shall not wear a man's garment. It is abomination. Now, I am aware that many have pushed this to excess of application, even to the point of forbidding women from wearing pants, even though those pants may be really for women. But uh, there is a principle here that when you appear through your garment, through your apparel, you appear as a respectable woman because you are trying to be consistent with your Christian profession. And think about your witness. Your apparel may help or hinder your Christian witness. Halimbawa, nakikipagpatutuo ka sa isang lalaki and yet you are wearing a, an apparel that is provocative. Again, using the same metaphor of the sin of Judah, it says in Ezekiel 23:40, For them you bathe yourself, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. This is yung tinatawag na flaunting. Flaunting her beauty. Flaunting her body. And this is not right for women, though there is the right place for being wholesome, even beautiful. Uh, through your manner of dressing but this is uh, wrong when it is provocative so sa mga sisters ng iglesia itong booklet na ito ay na ipamahagi not too long ago from the free grace broadcaster on the issue of modest apparel read it if you have not yet read it and uh, there is an article here by Jeff Pollard, Christian Modesty Defined, and he says this, Excess and sensuality, both of these bear on modesty. Christian women must self-consciously control their hearts and passions instead of arraying themselves elaborately, expensively, and or sensually. If they are modest, they will not draw attention to themselves in the wrong way. Their clothing will not say sex or pride 
or money, but purity, humility, and moderation. Searching words. Let those words search you, dear sisters. And let me give you the ultimate beauty tip of the Bible. Let beauty radiate. It is not made up. Ang sasabihin sa ilagi ng mundo ay tamang makeup, tamang mga pananamit. Walang masama doon sa panlabas. But for the real beauty, it is something that radiates from the inner character. And therefore, the right beauty to aspire after is that which reveals that inner character. The gentle and quiet spirit, as Peter says, as a woman who professes to worship God, as Paul says. And my final text that is appropriate for this is Proverbs 31 and verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. And the word vain means brief or fleeting. Panandalian lamang yan. Ano man ang kagandahan mo, pagkaedad mo, lilipas din yan. But this is what lasts. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And let everyone, especially our dear sisters, say Amen to that. Kaya sa inyong mga kababaihan, ang aking pamanhik ay uh, mag Sikap kayo sa biyaya ng Diyos para sa kabanalan, pero isipin nyo rin na maaring maging kasangkapan kayo ng jablo para sa panunukso sa mahalay na pag-iisip ng inyong mga kapatid na lalaki. At of course, we are also talking of unbelievers in public. Eh, maging concerned tayo and I hope that ating sikapin ng ating pananamit ay ang uri na magsasabi sa iba ng iyong katangiang panloob. Do not aspire for the response of wow because of the external. Rather sick that when people look at you, they see an honorable woman and one who can be, of whom it could be said, she is a woman who fears the Lord, worthy of praise. Maraming salamat sa inyong pakikinig at nawa ay nakinabang kayo, pagpalain kayo ng Panginoon at magkaroon ng mas malalim na hangarin na magpakabanal alang-alang sa pag-ibig ng Diyos sa biyaya ng Panginoong Heso Kristo at sa tulong ng banal na espiritu, maraming salamat.